Hi there everyone and welcome back to Higher Biology. Today we are going to move on to the second key area of Unit 2 which is called Cellular Respiration. You might remember respiration from National 5, obviously at higher we go a bit deeper into the process of respiration, but don't worry if your memory of respiration is hazy or maybe you've just totally tried to forget about it. We are going to go through the process uh, step by step to make sure you're fully aware of everything. Personally I would recommend watching this video stage by stage and taking your notes, maybe drawing the diagrams, rather than trying to learn all of this in one go. So let's begin with a definition of cellular respiration. So essentially what respiration is, is a series of metabolic pathways that break down the glucose, which you obtain from the food that you eat, into energy that you require for survival. More specifically, this energy is in the form of a high energy compound called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. So, this should be a recap for you, but this high energy compound of ATP consists of an adenosine molecule, that's three inorganic phosphate molecules attached to it, therefore the triphosphate. And the important part here is if the terminal or final bond of these phosphates is broken, energy is released. Now, once this bond is broken and the energy is released, think of catabolic reactions from the previous key area, we are left with a compound called adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. There is also a single phosphate that is being cut off and separated, which we're going to be talking about further in a minute. Now, similar to catabolic and anabolic reactions, which we spoke about in the first key area, ATP and ADP go around in a bit of a cycle. So if you break down ATP into ADP plus a phosphate, this releases or transfers energy, but building up the ADP and the phosphate into an ATP requires energy. Apologies for saying ATP and ADP all the time. Now the key role of this ATP within cells is actually to transfer energy to cellular processes which require that energy in order to actually process. Now coming back to that loose phosphate that I talked about, the process of adding a phosphate onto a molecule is known as phosphorylation. This is an enzyme controlled process and essentially if ATP is broken down into ADP and a phosphate or PI, that released phosphate can then go on to phosphorylate other molecules. So now that we've had a recap of ATP, it's time that we move on to cellular respiration itself. So we are going to start off by looking at the three stages of respiration. More specifically, glycolysis, which you may remember, takes place regardless of whether oxygen is present, and the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain, which only takes place if oxygen is available. So let's have a closer look at where each of these reactions take place within a cell. In the previous key area, we had a look at the mitochondria, and you might remember that I said we'd taken a closer look at the structure of the mitochondrion in this key area, specifically the fact that a mitochondrion has two membranes, the inner and the outer. Now, glycolysis does not take place in the mitochondria. It takes place in the cytoplasm, which is the location of most cellular reactions. However, if oxygen is present, then we continue down this aerobic respiration pathway. In this case, the reactants move into the central part of the mitochondria, which is called the matrix of the mitochondria. This is where the next stage of respiration, called the citric acid cycle, takes place. Following this, the next stage, the electron transport chain, takes place along the inner mitochondrial membrane. So this is the membrane on the inside of the mitochondria, not the one on the outside. And we'll take another look at this when we cover the electron transport chain later in this video. So let's start with stage one, glycolysis, which you might remember the main processes from National 5. So as we just said, glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. This process breaks down this glucose, which as we said is obtained from the, the food that you eat, into first intermediate products, and then into a compound called pyruvate, which is what we're wanting at the end of things. One thing that's important to note here is that oxygen is not required for this stage. So regardless of oxygen being available or not, glycolysis will always take place. Now we're going to go into a bit more detail around glycolysis in terms of the amount of ATP molecules produced. So remember, the purpose of respiration is to produce ATP. That's what we're wanting to gain from the process of respiration. So in the first part of glycolysis, where glucose is broken down into intermediate products, two molecules of ATP are actually used up. 
because two molecules of ATP have been used or spent in this part of the action, we term this part the energy investment phase because the ATP has needed to be used to phosphorylate the intermediates. In the next stage, however, this is called the energy payoff stage. This is because four molecules of ATP have been formed. However, because two molecules of ATP were used in the energy investment phase, this means that during this entire process of glycolysis, there is a net gain of two molecules of ATP. So two are used up in energy investment, four are produced in energy payoff, giving you a total of two molecules of ATP. Finally, for glycolysis, a form of enzyme called dehydrogenase is used to remove hydrogen ions and electrons. These hydrogen ions and electrons are passed on to a coenzyme called NED, which then forms NEDH, which is the H from the hydrogen. The hydrogen ions and the electrons are going to be really important in the production of fuller molecules of ATP at a later stage in cellular respiration. So try and remember these, we'll come back to them later on, but it means we leave glycolysis with a molecule pyruvate, two molecules of ATP, and an NADH. Now, we just spoke about glycolysis taking place in the cytoplasm, and it takes place whether there is oxygen or not. This is going to be slightly different now. They're going to move on to stage two of respiration called the citric acid cycle. However, this could only take place if oxygen is available. If there's oxygen available, the pyruvate produced in glycolysis moves in to the middle of the mitochondria, which you may remember we call the matrix of the mitochondria. Now the citric acid cycle can sometimes look a little bit overwhelming at first, so we're going to break it down into two parts here. I'll talk through the process and then again I guarantee once you've paused it, drawn out the diagram and listened to it maybe a few times over, it will be much easier for you. So to begin with, we are going to use the pyruvate produced in glycolysis and this is going to go through a few changes before it's ready for use in the citric acid cycle. So this pyruvate is first converted to a molecule called acetyl. This acetyl molecule then combines with a coenzyme called coenzyme A and then quite simply the result of this is a new molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. Next, this acetyl coenzyme A combines with a molecule called oxaloacetate in order to form a molecule of citrate, hence the citric acid cycle. Now, through a series of enzyme-controlled reactions, this molecule of citrate is gradually converted back into oxaloacetate, resulting in the release of carbon dioxide. Now, you can see this is a cycle, so what should happen is as long as there's more acetyl coenzyme A being produced, then that oxaloacetate is then going to combine it's then going to be broken down again into citrate and steadily it's going to be processed back into that oxalastate and so on and so forth until there is no acetyl coenzyme A available. Now, most importantly though, as the citrate is converted back into oxalastate, dehydrogenase enzymes remove more of those hydrogen ions and electrons, again passing them on to NED to generate NEDH. Now these hydrogen ions and electrons from NEDH are then passed on to the next stage of respiration, the electron transport chain, where large amounts of ATP are going to be generated. So again, in terms of the location of stages, you need to be aware that the electron transport chain takes place in the inner mitochondrial membrane. As with the citric acid cycle, this can only take place if oxygen is present, and this end point of respiration is where all of these hydrogen ions and electrons are going to be used to generate ATP. As we've just mentioned, the electron transport chain takes place in the inner mitochondrial membrane, more specifically a series of carrier proteins which are attached to the inner mitochondrial membrane. So in this process, we require the NADH generated in glycolysis and in the citric acid cycle. The hydrogen ions and the electrons from the NADH are then passed on to the electron transport chain. As these electrons move along the chain, energy is released and when this energy is released that energy is used to pump the hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane from the matrix into the inner mitochondrial space so across that membrane. Now these hydrogen ions then flow through a protein called the ATP synthase membrane protein back into the matrix of the cytoplasm. By flowing through this ATP synthase protein 36 molecules of ATP are generated, 
So this is by far the most ATP produced in respiration. So the protein, the enzyme that's used to generate this though, is the ATP synthase protein. That's the really important part. Now finally, these hydrogen ions and electrons then combine with oxygen, which you might remember was required for these processes to take place. Now oxygen is described as the final hydrogen acceptor, as it combines with the hydrogen to form water. This means that we end this entire process of respiration with 38 molecules of ATP, 36 from electron transport chain, 2 from glycolysis, carbon dioxide, which was produced in the citric acid chain, uh, cycle, sorry, and then we have water, which was just produced here in the electron transport chain. Now, just to finish off respiration, we are going to quickly talk about what happens if oxygen is not present after glycolysis, and these further processes are not able to take place. In this instance, a process called fermentation occurs. This means that ATP is not generated after glycolysis, meaning that fermentation is far less efficient than aerobic respiration because only two molecules of ATP are produced in comparison to 38. So you might remember these differences from National 5, it's fairly similar here, but in animals, glycolysis still takes place. There is still a net gain of two molecules of ATP and that pyruvate is still produced. However, this pyruvate cannot go through the process of the citric acid cycle. If there's no oxygen available, this pyruvate instead is converted into a molecule of lactate. However, as we discussed in the previous key area, this is an example of a reversible reaction. So if oxygen was to become available, this lactate could become converted back to pyruvate, and then the process of aerobic respiration could continue on as normal. However, plants and yeasts are slightly different. In the absence of oxygen, again, glycolysis takes place, again, there's two molecules of ATP produced, but this time, the pyruvate is converted into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Now, this is known as an irreversible reaction, meaning that even if oxygen was to become available, the ethanol and carbon, uh, carbon dioxide could not be converted back to pyruvate. The main takeaway from fermentation, however, is that it is less efficient than aerobic respiration. Less ADP is produced than in aerobic respiration. Now, after a lot of information being thrown at you, that is finally the end of respiration. Please make sure you go through each stage again. I really recommend drawing out the stages to get them into your head, uh, and eventually you'll be able to draw out the entire process or write out the entire process, and that's really key to getting it stuck into your memory. Be sure to remember all the key terms I've used, where each process takes place, the purpose of NADH, purpose of the ATP synthase protein, etc. Just make sure you know all the, the keywords and have a look through these lists here. As always, thanks very much to all of you for watching these videos. Uh, I know a lot of you were waiting on the rest of Unit 2 being uploaded, so I'll be getting on with the rest of the course, uh, especially now we're back at remote learning. So take care and thanks very much for listening, everyone, and I'll see you again with Kira 3 Metabolic Weight. Thanks very much.